Morant with a running start. Elevate! Oh, oh, it does! Oh, oh my goodness! Oh. He's done tie game in overtime. Gasol will turn his heat. It's gone! It's Gasol Seven tenths remain. Only now with three. Count it! A 15 point play for Memphis. And Blake Griffin gets into it on the floor with Randolph. Hard to tell if there are any punches being thrown under there, but Griffin took exception. Adams going long. Moran! Oh, he hit it! He hit it! He hit it! He hit it! John Moran! Insanity! You gotta be kidding me. Welcome to Grits and Grinds, a Memphis Grizzlies podcast. My name is Keith Parrish, and I'm joined on today's episode by Sean Coleman. Sean, how are you doing? <laughs> Making it through the uh, the the doldrums of March. Uh, not 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 feeling too well, but <laughs> oh, I'm sorry to hear it. Unrelated to basketball, you're not feeling well. Yeah, yeah, but I feel about like the Grizzly season so far. But Keith, Keith, I I, I think I've got it. You know, Draymond got ejected yeah, last night, but he did. I actually applaud it for you as someone who hosts multiple NBA podcasts. Listen, he had to get resourceful and creative to come up with content in late March. That's what it was for. So I mean, I, he of course is a competitor as yeah. I, and I don't mean a competitor on the basketball court. I mean, he is my competition as a podcaster himself. Very, very and true. it doesn't feel totally ethical for him to be maybe affecting his team's games although his team won, but he's like doing things that hurt his team to create his own content that feels like a conflict of interest that might feel like Jonte Porter purposely not shooting three pointers. I don't know. Those are just allegations. Listen, listen, LeBron is now officially in the podcast game. So you, 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 you have to it's go true. to extreme measures. You got to go to extreme measures. Pleasure being um, with you. Thanks for having me. No, I honestly, I'm super proud of you for gutting this out. If you were on the Grizzlies, you would probably miss four games. With your, <laughs> what do you guess? Some sinuses, maybe a little cold. Yeah. Like, I'd, oh, I'd be reevaluated. Yeah, three. you're, you're, he's doubtful, doubtful with illness. Um, is ever has anyone checked on my guy Vince Williams Jr.? That's I, that's a shame to hear. I, I, I mean, I, do I have to not? I can't call him the machine anymore, can I? If I he's mean, if he's been doubtful for three weeks, that has to be a record, at least for the Grizzlies. I don't. No, know it's definitely play. not. Uh, was it Zaire? Didn't oh. Zaire do a full month on doubtfuls? That, that is Am I correct. dreaming this? No, he no, went, he went not. there. There was like a 10 game span where he was doubtful, 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 out, 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 doubtful, doubtful. And then they're like, Hey, he's going to miss three weeks. We're going to reevaluate him. <laughs> so. yeah. yeah. Just there, there, there's, the, there's a lot that needs to be reevaluated, but Keith, always a pleasure being with you. Hope, hope you're well on your end. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm good. Um, uh, doldrums, doldrums. Yeah. The basketball game. So Brandon Clark played. Okay, there's the joy. We hosted a, I hosted a watch party in Nashville. Uh, it was pretty fun, uh, mostly because of Brandon Clark. We were all super excited when he checked in. Um, of course, there was that exciting run at the end of the third quarter where it's like, whoa, are the Lakers going to fall down and blow this? Because they're playing on the second night of a back-to-back. -back. The Lakers went to double overtime the night before. I was telling people incorrectly for most of the game. I was like, Hey, the second half, we'll have a chance to make our push. Like we're playing at home. We're shaking off coming home from a West coast trip. That's always tough, but like their second half of back to back, man, if we can just hang in it, we can get somewhere in the second half. Um, we had a run, but we didn't get anywhere. Um, still got blown out, but Brandon Clark played Sean. All I got to say is he was a plus 15. Yeah, there we, we did it. He's back. Yeah, He's back. Absolutely. Single absolutely. game plus minus who cares? Brandon Clark played was a plus 15 in a blowout loss. That's all I needed to see. What'd you see from Brandon? Um, it, it was great to see, you know, him take the, uh, I, for, I forget who was guarding him. I think it may have been Tar Tarin Prince, but uh, it was great to see him, you know, take the dribble from the corner and be able to put the shot up. Now, the thing that I will say is, is that you could automatically see right into there. He was in his first game back because typically Brandon Clark with his pogo like athleticism that he had, he's got that ball up. Clearly, Tyron Prince like crazy. This one, he kind of had to float it over, but he's got the trust, I think, in, in his movements and his offensive ability. You know, nothing's changed about his mind, which I think is an underrated aspect of his game, being able to create his shots at times. 
But listen, I think you're going to see from him kind of like you saw from Jared in the 2021 season when Jared came back for those 11 games off the knee injury. You're going to see spurts of what we're used to Brandon Clark doing, but you're just not going to see the consistency because he's simply trying to get his legs back under him. But at the end of the day, especially coming off the injury that he did and how much it affects a player like him, it was just awesome to see him on the court. Yeah, and Taylor Jenkins was asked after the game, I believe by Chris Harrington, like why did the team um, – just want him to come back or why do they let him come back and play this year? Obviously the season is going nowhere. Why not let him just get, you know, six months more healthy. And Taylor Jenkins said they wanted him to start building confidence. They wanted him to get used to um, just playing basketball again and knowing he's going to be rusty just so he can then in the off season, maybe hit the off season running um, or like not physically running, but just, you know, propel what he does through these games, even if it is choppy at times. I mean, like, yeah, he had a couple of those nice finishes we're used to. He did a good job on the glass, you know, pretty much. Um, he even took a three-pointer. Or, I mean, obviously, what did you think of the form? It, has it changed at all? It's no. always been a little squirrely. It it uh, it waxes and wanes based on the season. But, um, no, I was... <laughs> Just stop taking threes. Just focus on the twos. That's no, we you, you're pro you were probably part of the uh, Z Xavier Tillman stop shooting threes. Everyone shoots threes. <sighs> Every open corner three, let them go. Uh, uh, well, like I say, I I'm glad that we're focused on making that a bigger part of the offense, but it's uh -oh. so bad how little we make of them. So. <laughs> I mean, the team, unfortunately, like actually kind of made threes. Uh, what they made 17 out of 43. Uh, once again, continuing the weird season long. What tendency to lose when they make threes? I don't doesn't make any sense. Um, if, if there's a, if there's a fun thing to track, I, I had it. I tracked it a couple of weeks ago. I have to look at it after the show, but I'm pretty positive that we're in good range to for the first time ever, Keith make a thousand threes in the season you know I, I said a few a few years ago a thousand three if, if this team could ever make a thousand threes regularly that's what you need around jaw and jared to, to yeah. really get going but of course with how much we attempted this year the efficiency that i thought would come with a thousand threes has not been there but hey you know it, take whatever positive you can this year so so it, it's hard to it's hard to evaluate basically this whole season and one of the questions I have for this year that I don't know the answer to is just like, basically, does this offense work? I mean, st statistically, no, it's been horrible, but like we're missing all the key ingredients. And when I look at the three point rate and I look at the fact that, yeah, we're going to we're going to smash all these records for our team, for our franchise, you know, of making three pointers, but it hasn't necessarily correlated to winning. And so, like, I think my big question for this year and going forward is, will it all look right with Ja? Will it all look right when you have that attacking guard who can, you know, 25 point per game score, who's going to score in the paint? Well, then it makes sense that we just launch threes. We spam three pointers seemingly nonstop. Otherwise, I mean, I'm not sure if it is, but I mean, it couldn't look worse. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I, I know I probably harp on this too much and, and put whatever relevance you want to, because I know March basketball, you know, comes with a caveat, a grain of salt. You yeah, know? this is not real. I keep telling yeah. people, this is not real. <laughs> but if you go back to last March, you know, when we were trying to reinvent ourselves with basically replacing Stephen Adams with Luke Kennard, and we had jaw in and out of the lineup and things such as that, you know, it, it worked a little bit, right? You know, we had the best offensive stretch that we had under Taylor Jenkins. And again, I know that you don't want to put too much on like a 25 game sample size, but then we go into the playoffs against the Lakers, and when Luke Kennard was on the court, it, it was a clear benefit for us. Yep. Now, does that happen over the second or third round of a playoffs as you move forward? Probably not. But, but the main point that I'm getting at is, is that I definitely think that with Taylor Jenkins wanting to try this many threes, the idea is to get the reps in there for his depth. Because I do think that moving forward, especially now without Steven Adams, and depending on what they do, you know, at the center position moving forward, I do think they want the three to be a, a bigger part of the overall reliability when it comes to the offense, especially if they keep Kadar beyond this year. Yeah, I think watching the game last night specifically, and this is some of the frustrations that maybe the the, the patrons at Nobles Beer Hall were talking about, was a lot of this just like it seems like, you know, if it's first good shot but maybe goods in parentheses. It's, it's basically first time you get a glimpse at a three pointer, you like fire it up. And we were, some of them were grumbling and I couldn't disagree with them where they're just like, why hasn't Jaron touched the ball in the paint? 
Like J- Jaron is easily our best offensive option. He has a mismatch in the paint and it's just like, whatever, whoever, whoever gets it on the wing, if it's Lamar Stevens open, or if it's Jake LaRavia on a career night, or if it's Gigi Jackson who loves shooting, or even if it's Desmond Bain pull up, it's just like, we just keep shooting. We, we pull up, we dribble up the court, we shoot. And it's like, Jaron hasn't touched the ball. Like, you know, so I don't know. That's a frustration. And again, I don't know. How, I, I don't, I might just be wrong as in aesthetically, this scheme might work once you had John Morant. Like, if you make whatever it is, if you make 35% of your threes, that might be a higher points per possession than even letting Jaron touch the ball in the paint. But it does feel like we get too, um, just, I don't know what the term is, just not, there's not enough variety in the offense where it's always just like, you got to mix it up, touch the paint, in and out sometimes. Um, and, and, B, I feel like they need to be cognizant of like, hey, our all-star hasn't touched the ball. Maybe not. Maybe that slows down the offense. Well, um, Adam Mears, uh, Mears, I know that you've spoke with him before. I believe that he uh, covers the Denver Nuggets. I, he, yeah, he, oh, yeah, Adam Mares. Yeah, yeah. Adam Mares, excuse me. I believe that he at least alluded to this stat. He may have found it himself, but what, like, the last 13 NBA champions have finished sixth or better in effective field goal percentage, and that hits on what you're talking about. You know, the fact that the Grizzlies under Taylor Jenkins haven't been better than 20th. So, yes. <laughs> listen, listen, finding more, finding better looks from three, is great and that'll happen more with y'all and smart and made and everybody healthy but at the end of the day it doesn't need to be your best shot every time listen we can have the three-point shot be a bigger part of our offense you want it to be a bigger part of our offense but you also have to look at the fact we're but near the bottom of the league at two-point field goal percentage we yeah. got to consistently get better to your point of finding the best shot possible you hope that jaron bain and jaw become more outlets to do that but you got to see it before you believe it. And this year hasn't really, you know, put a lot of faith in that being something that instantly clicks next year. So um, one guy who was making his three pointers, Jake LaRavia. Wow. The Jake LaRavia game. Um, I was texting with some Lakers friends and they were like, what's happening to us? Cause during the run, I was like, Hey, we've got you right where we want you. Um, but, uh, but just uh, Jake explodes for a career high. He has 25 points. He makes a career high seven, three pointers. He raised his career three point percentage from 28.8% to 31.3%. Jake made 13% of his career threes last night. So have a night, Jake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I was surprised. I think like 15 Grizzlies have had, you know, there have been 15 times where a player had 25 plus points, seven threes or more off the bench. It's happened more often than you think. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, you know, Laravia is, you know, by far the youngest. But, um, you know, I, I kind of, you know, speak to the same thing about him and Gigi this March. It's awesome to see what they're doing. You know, they, yeah. they show that Gigi shows that he definitely is going to be at the very least an NBA rotation player moving forward. Jake Laravia has shown at least that he belongs in the NBA in some shape, fashion, or form. But, um, last night, the three-point shot fall. It fell. For, for Laravia, though, um, he's shown some extra stuff when it comes to defensive playmaking and his ability to get to the rim. I think that he's got a little bit more resourcefulness that people gave him credit for than he showed in March. But at the end of the day, if the three-point shot's not falling, he's just not an NBA rotation player. So as good as he's been, I think he's one of those players where when we talk about, listen, take March production with a great assault that applies to Jake LaRavia. But Hey, it's fun to see that there's some NBA type productivity there and what it leads to for his future. We'll wait and see. Yeah. I like that term. He used resourcefulness because that honestly, like he makes stuff happen, even though he's not shooting the ball. Well, he's limited athletically, but like he does stuff and it was cool to see him finally have a game where the shot did fall for him um, to, to be able to experience that. Maybe if we can just get that three foot percentage to like 32%, 34, you know, like, like if he's a 32 to 35% three point shooter that combined with his other skills, you're like, all right, that's, that's a rotation NBA player. Um, another, maybe the, the other statistical abnormality from this game is a uh, Desmond Bain having a career high 16 assists. He's the uh, first Grizzly to have that many assists since jaw had 17 against the Raptors in December of 2022. Um, he had 26 points. That's the most points in franchise history for any player having 16 or more assists. Um, Sean, 
if you didn't watch the game, you might have thought Desmond Bain was dominant. Yeah. I don't want to poke holes in this exciting performance. And after all this, we're, we're struggling for things to talk about. I had, I had a guy at the watch party who, who listens to the show, who was like, Hey, actually I haven't listened in the past, like few weeks. What have you been talking about? And I'm like, <laughs> brother, let me tell you, not much. There's no strategy to talk about. There's no, like, I wish they would have played these guys to talk about. It's just like, well, Desmond Bain had a career high assist. When I say Desmond Bain wasn't that maybe impressive if you watched the game, I think something like two of his 16 assists were what I would call like a super assist where he threw it to a guy for an easy shot. <laughs> like something around 10 to 14 of them were I threw it to a guy, he dribbled around, did some stuff, then hit a three. So congrats, congrats, Bain, on the big number. I don't know if it was truly that impressive if you actually watched the game. It was the Stockton assist from the 90s. It <laughs> was very much the Stockton assist. He threw it to like Lamar Stevens. Lamar Stevens had like a six second, second possession with so many dribbles. I mean, I thought maybe because I went back and watched him because I was like, I was just curious how many were just LaRavia. Like if LaRavia makes seven threes, you might put up some good assist numbers. But honestly, only a couple were to LaRavia. A lot of them were to Jaron. Then Jaron dribbles around, gets fouled, makes the shot. Um, but still, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm now poking holes in the only good things we have to talk about. Well, one thing that I'll take away from it is that, you know, he had 13 points and, and six assists um, in the third quarter of last night. And only Jaws, the only other person who's had that level of productivity. Mm. The, the reason I bring that up, though, is that what if we could get Desmond Bain to a point to where maybe not every game, but on a frequent basis, he can be a singular source of 15 plus points. You know, he himself scores his seven to 10 in the quarter and then maybe three or four assists. What if he can become more frequent doing that? You know, we want to talk about the offense becoming more consistent. If you could have Bay doing that, especially if Jaws on the bench, I think that that is a good indication. And we've seen that more this year. Like we've seen, you know, the, the self-sufficient scoring ability that's been elite at times this year, but also combining the assists. So I agree with you. You know, it, it was, it, this wasn't to a Tyrese Halliburton, you know, performance. I, I won't put it there. <laughs> but I, I will say that it, it does show that Bain is capable of it. Like I think that's the big thing to take away from right now, Keith, is that you're seeing what people are capable of. But especially yeah. for Bain, when you know he's going to get the opportunity in the future, can he do that more frequently? And if he can, hey, that's one other caveat that can make our offense more consistent. I want to say it was the last assist where they were like on the broadcast, they were like, and that's 16 assists. And I was like, what? Cause like, <laughs> I didn't remember again, I'm at a bar, so I'm not following. I, I can't keep up with the stats that closely. Um, but the, I was still like, I don't remember that many, you know, cause like the ones that stick out in your head are the dimes where you're like, Oh, nice, nice pass to the cutting guy for the dunk. Like he found Brandon Clark. You know, bro, Brandon Clark hit the little floater and you're like, that's great to see. But speaking to your point of like, you know, when, when we talk about the positives of this season, like Bain has showed like he could he could flat out play point guard just flat out. Um, and the versatility that gives your lineups going forward, the roster freedom it gives you like we don't need like Scotty Pippen Jr. on the two way like Scotty Pippen Jr. continued his nice run of just making shots and things. But like. Scotty Pippen Jr. on a two-way, that's prob you're probably good for next year, assuming Marcus Smart's still on the team and you got Bain and Ja, like, and Vince Williams Jr., all the stuff he's shown this year, um, passing the basketball and handling playmaking duties. The Grizzlies are well set up, you know, for the future, is particularly in the ball handling department. Um, let's talk a little bit more about that future, and we'll do that right after this quick break. All right, so wrapping up this game before maybe we, th we think about, I don't know, some prospects or some strategy for the team in roster building uh, this offseason. Um, off the bench, you know, Lamar Stevens keeps scoring. It's just what he does. Um, would you prefer he took fewer than 13 shots to get 11 points? Yes, I would. Um, it was good to see Dickie Giroux make some buckets uh, after struggling to score in the last few games. Um I said, Scotty Pippen Jr., you know, he's been just a consistent, like, just consistent play. Like, I don't think he's a table setter, you know, like, but like, oh. but he's a guard who can, he can hit shots and he can get to the rim. And 
I try not to get carried away because when I think about like the the backup point guards in the NBA, they are sort of ubiquitous. Like you can find them anywhere. Like yes. I mean, you're and Jordan, you're, you're, you're Jordan McLaughlin's of the world, where you show up, you're like, oh, that guy's pretty good. But but Scotty Pippen, I think, is from this performance this year. Like I, I I'll be honest, I don't know the how you know his two way contract materializes next year or anything. Scotty Pippen Jr. right now could be a productive backup point guard for a rebuilding team. Like he's someone yeah. that can definitely help you out. May not necessarily be the facilitator that Tyus Jones is to help others improve, but he definitely could be a productive backup point guard in the league. And his shot has certainly translated better to the NBA than I thought it would. He's always kind of been that paint scoring type guy, but I didn't realize his shot probably not going to sustain where it is, but it's been pretty good so far. Well, the thing about his shot, it, unlike Brandon Clark, it looks great. His form looks amazing. And, and, you know, like he was expected to be, like you said, like the blow by guy, the guy who gets to the rim and scores despite his diminutive stature. But like, if he keeps making these threes, you think, yeah, he's got a, a pretty solid, you know, chance to, to remain probably on the fringes of the NBA. Um, Gigi Jackson in this game wasn't really heard from the most. Um, he's been, he's been up and down a lot. And I know there's a lot of Christmas fans who are like over the moon about Gigi Jackson, maybe personality wise. I just don't get that about maybe players that much um, more. So I, maybe I get, I get carried away with guys that I know maybe have a limited ceiling. Like I get blown away by Vince Williams jr. Cause I'm just like, Oh, that guy has the knack of defense. And like, he has that dog in him. I can see it. GG, like as far as what his ceiling is, I have no idea. What have you made of Gigi's last stretch of games and how much you translate what he's doing, which is having some really big games, but then how is that going to translate? Hopefully when the games mean more next year. Sure. Uh, I, one thing that I, that I think that's there about Gigi is that, you know, he, he's he's shown some resourcefulness. You know, I use that word again to be able to maintain being relevant as a score because, you know, his January when he was doing so well, it was off a 46 percent shooting from three stretch that, that wasn't going to sustain since the beginning of February. He shot 33 percent from the th th three point he's catch and shoot 35% in this month of March, when he's done so well, he's 42% from the field and 33% from three. I don't mean that as a knock necessarily. He's just a 19 year old volume score, but, but the reason that he's still been able to have good stretches of scoring is because he's become more self-sufficient and more reliable getting to the rim. His free throws are up. His ability to get to the, the rim consistently is up. There is definitely, you know, Matt Issa, I believe, came out with that article the other day talking about the fact that he shows some very intriguing signs as a play finisher, not necessarily as a play creator. And that'll come in time. But yes, it's awesome to see what he's doing. But with Vince Williams, you see him do the small things that impact winning. GG, that's not his style as of yet. He's more of a scoring first type uh, mentality, whereas Vince is more of a supportive type mentality. Um, I think with GG, Next year, you just simply let him thrive off the bench. The thing that I'll say is this. I, I looked it up. You know, I'd had some conversations with Grizz fans and things like that. And they said that Gigi should be starting next year. And that's a fine perspective to have. But, Keith, I looked it up. Like, right now, the eighth team in the West has a 58% winning percentage. The yep. Grizz clearly want to make the playoffs next year. There have only been eight times in NBA history where a player 20 or younger has averaged more than 13 points for a team that won 58% of their games. Uh, that is Magic Johnson, Jason Tatum twice, mm -hmm. Carmelo Anthony, Stephon Marbury, Kobe Bryant. If you think Gigi's to that level of talent, he's going to force his hand no matter what. You relied on him potentially being a starter next year, I think is flawed. Just let him thrive on the bench around good passing minds like Vincent Kennard maybe or Bain maybe, and that's what I think is going to help his development the most. Yeah, it's that's that's a great point. It's a, it's a great stat. Like I'm with you where if he starts next year, that's great. That's mean that means he's made a, a huge leap. I'm I'm personally not expecting a huge leap. I'm just hoping for a huge leap. Yeah, let him let him come along slowly. Um although we did see glimpses last night, Sean. Uh I mean, I feel like for those people who are super high on Gigi Jackson and we saw the lineup of the future, we saw a lot of Desmond Bain, Gigi Jackson, Brandon Clark, and Jaron. Those four guys were playing all together. Scotty Pippen, I think, was the point guard most of the time. But I was like, hey, that's our four, man. You add John to that. That's what everybody's dreaming about, right? Um, you hope that. I, I, yeah. I want that to be the outcome. I want, want, want to make sure I'm not trying to 
be negative on Gigi. I want for that to be the outcome. Yeah. Just expecting it without doing anything else to me seems a bit flawed. I even went out there and said, you know, if, if like, for instance, if Gigi Jackson is in our best five lineup next year, I think that points to the fact that it's been a disappointing summer because I think that you want to probably go get more of a veteran, reliable type option. And again, at the end of the day, man, if Gigi can force his hand to where he becomes that starter or that yeah. guy that can play in those high leverage situations, that's a great thing. We all hope for it. I just don't know if it's the smartest thing to fully expect it. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to get people super angry at me, but go look at Kevin Knox's career stats. Uh, Kevin Knox was a super young 19-year-old rookie who put up some similar rookie numbers. Um, uh, I think Gigi's a better player, but also Kevin Knox was drafted top 10. A lot was expected of him, so um, it's not Gigi's future, but just slow down. Um, let's just let him come along and hopefully he'll be great. But uh, speaking of the future, speaking of the offseason, um, how have your draft thoughts evolved maybe since the start of the NCAA tournament or just watching the Grizzlies? Are you still, have you, have you grown like, okay, we got to trade it, the pick, or are you seeing guys where you're like, no, 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 Donovan Klingon, if we get him at seven, eight, nine, bang, home run, we can feel good about that. Um, trading back. Stay oh. Stay, stays my number one goal. Uh, I even was to the point of, you know, up until the beginning of March, you know, if we got a top two pick and SAR was there, you take SAR no matter what. Yeah. I think that if SAR, Rob Dillingham, and Reed Shepard are all on the board or two of those three are on the board when we pick, you definitely look to trade back. Because okay. then if you can get a potential vet or, you know, especially a big wing, you can get someone who's proven that they have, you know, could have some success in the NBA and you may be able to build on that Memphis. If you can get that and then also keep your first round pick to go get you a big, maybe the late lottery or the teens, maybe get a Kyle Filipowski at that point. Yeah. I like that option. That's going to be hard to do. We know in recent years, uh, I was talking with, uh, you know, Matt Herdlick and others about this. Just in recent years, it's hard to trade back, though. And especially in a draft where there's not really tiers in this draft. You probably are going to see people be satisfied with three or four options at each pick. Um, but in my end, this also is not a draft where there's really a lot of upside. Sam Vecini on his podcast yesterday brought up a great point. This isn't a draft where you're really going to find those upside guys to really be a part of your core you're going to consider to be a ch your next championship run. This is a draft where you're going to find guys to complement those type of guys. And so in my opinion, that means not necessarily go for upside, go for value and roster need maybe a little bit more than you would upside. And to me, Donovan Cleegan still stands out to me that if we land in that six to nine spot. The only hesitation that I have is, is Donovan Gleegan the type of person that could develop into a true playoff rotation type player? It's hard to say he could because he's not an outside big. You could see Kyle Filipowski potentially being that type of player or one of the big wings like Muzelis or Holland. So I really haven't settled on, you know, just a straightforward philosophy as of yet, but I am kind of angling towards if you can't trade back, just go with value. And Donovan Gleegan with his efficiency around the rim of both ends, he certainly fits a lot of needs. So you're not you're you're saying if I'm hearing you right you're saying your trade back scenarios would be if you jump up if they if they get lucky and go to that top four then maybe slide back still later maybe still top ten so where you can get if it is Reed or Dillingham or Klingon or or whoever might be there that's on your board I think that I'll put it in tiers like this if you get yeah. the top three yeah. and you get a SAR first explore a trade opportunity where you could trade back and pick a Klingon yeah. Instead of picking SAR, or if you're in this six to nine spot, if someone wants to trade up, you may not get Klingon, but trade back into the team, see what you can get, and then get a Filipowski. I think there's levels that you can go. Yeah. I'd be fine with any of those three players at the levels of the draft that I mentioned. I don't think a trade back's that likely, but I think there's scenarios to at least explore. And you're not going to trade up to get your guy Dalton Connect? <laughs> no, I, I, if, if he falls to us, that'll be great. But like I say, we. <laughs> We, we've gone the shooting value route before. I think that he would be a great addition to the team, but I'm not going to bang the drum for him when I think there's probably more upside and more and other players that feel bigger needs for us. So, I, you know, I think everyone knows I don't watch college basketball and I'm always playing catch up, trying to learn the prospects. Um, everything I hear and the stats I see about Filipowski jump out where I'm like, that sounds like an NBA guy. 
That sounds like a guy that you'd want to have. And I feel like he was really high on draft boards earlier in the year. And now he's like settled way down. So I guess he's just someone I guess I'm going to watch closely in the sweet 16 as close as I can bear to watch college basketball. Kyle Filipowski, Keith, at the, at the beginning of the year, him and Reed Shepard stood out to me as being the two guys by far that hit those Grizz thresholds. You know, the defensive playmaking, the passing, the efficiency, the true shooting, all that. And Filipowski still stands out. I think with Filipowski, what kind of gives hesitation to others is that he shows a lot of productivity away from the rim. Will he be able to do that at the rim like a Kalean can do? And yeah. the Griffins probably need that efficiency at the rim, rebounding, uh, efficiency at the rim, scoring, screening, all that different stuff. But the, what Filipowski does away from the rim, that may make him more likely to be in a playoff rotation. Um, so I think that with Filipowski, it's the fact that he, there's not as clear of a translation with him to the NBA as there is with the Klingon, but you can make an argument that he still could have his high, a higher upside than Klingon. So I, gotcha. I, if, the, if the Grizzlies took him, I'd be perfectly fine with it. Sounds good. Well, Sean, thanks, man, for coming on again. It's always fun talking basketball, talking to the Grizzlies with you. Um, all you guys out there, go check out Sean's work. Um, follow him on Twitter. Uh, the guy is a, a machine with Grizzlies content. Anyway, Sean, I look forward to you coming on again sometime. Hope those uh, Hope that crud clears up for you. Hey, always a pleasure, Keith. My best to your family. You have a great one, all right? All right. See you, Sean.